record the talk. So <clears throat> it is my pleasure and my honor to introduce Adrian Lewis, the speaker of our seminar today. So uh, yeah, I'm very happy that Adrian accepted our invitation because he is uh, one of the yeah, uh, experts in optimization with the amazing contribution yeah, uh, to the connections between optimization and semi algebraic geometry. Yeah. He was uh, very much behind uh, Kurdikalia service property uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, which, played a, or which plays a role in our community. So Adrian is a science fellow. He uh, received many important prizes. Probably the most famous one from our point of view is the Lagrange prize. And uh, yeah, as I said, he will talk today uh, on uh, smoothness in not optimization. So Adrian, stage is yours. Great. Thanks very much, Radu. And, uh, and it's a great pleasure to, to be here, wherever, wherever here is, wherever you are. Um, so, uh, um, as Radu mentioned, you know, one of my, one of the themes of my, of, of my, um, one of the threads of my research is this sort of interface between, between geometric ideas and, and algebraic ideas. And this talk kind of sits on that interface. It's, it's joint work. It talks about joint work with, with various co-authors, many of them around this, this, uh, unifying theme of, um, of, of the interface between variational geometry and algorithms and and then inherently the interface between smooth and non-smooth ideas in, in optimization so that's uh, broadly the thread um so i i want to start by posing uh three questions i guess um if i can get my screen share working um so so the, the first question is the, the is exactly on this on this interface so why is it even though you know, many, many of the problems that we look at in optimization are inherently non-smooth. Why, why then do we see smooth behavior associated with them? So, for example, if you make random perturbations, often the solution or the optimal value varies smoothly, even with respect to the perturbation, even though the problem itself is not smooth. So what's going on there? Um, many of us would have different ideas about how to frame that, but that's a sort of a unifying question that I want to come back to. And then, you know, if we're explicit, somehow explicitly aware of that structure that's encouraging that kind of smooth behavior, can we capitalize on, on that explicit structure using Newtonian kind of ideas? How do we go about that using, using Newton type schemes to use that smoothness? And so let me, let me give you an example of that. So, um, you know, a kind of canonical basic example is something like the projected gradient method. Um, so I'm minimizing a, a smooth function over some constraint set Q. Um, I rewrite the optimality conditions as, as uh, the gradient belonging being, being a negative normal direction. And then if we think about projected gradient methods as sort of very old scheme, those methods, even though you're applying it to a non-smooth set, like, a, like a, a polytope, for example, very often a projected gradient scheme will identify some kind of smoothness in Q, some kind of smooth sub-manifold in, in, in Q that where all in some sense the activity resides so after a while after finitely many iterations you you kind of hit that manifold um so that's the sort of classical philosophy behind active set methods in in optimization and then it's very very natural and people have asked for for, for decades how one then tries to accelerate the behavior of the algorithm using newtonian kind of algorithms based on the idea that you're, you're now in a smooth situation so that's that's the kind of uh, the sort of canonical classical setup where you have some kind of explicit structure that you can try to capitalize on. But then you might also ask, well, um, what if you don't have explicit structure? What if you what if there's just some kind of uh, implicit knowledge that some kind of structure like that is sitting under your problem? You don't know explicitly what it is, but you think some kind of manifold behavior is there. So can you can you think about a, a black box algorithm that, that that doesn't rely on the structure of the problem, but that can still be potentially fast and in particular super linear. So that's been a kind of a holy holy grail of convex optimization for for a long time. Um, is is there roughly speaking a super linearly convergent black box convex optimization algorithm that will work on some reasonably large class of concrete problems? Okay, so that and and what I want to sort of um, propose is that there is, is a potentially positive answer to that. And I want to give you, you know, I'll just sort of tease you with a picture. Um, 
I'm just seeing if I can uh, just get rid of that. So, so here's a uh, here's a picture of an algorithm along those lines. It's a black box algorithm. It's actually applied to an eigenvalue optimization problem. Um, uh, so I've compared it, so it's a local algorithm, so I've started it by starting with some bundle method, a, a crude proximal bundle method. It's, as I said, a, a, um, a you know, moderate-sized eigenvalue optimization problem. And the green line is a sort of a, B, a, a, a kind of a crude BFGS implementation, non-smooth BFGS. The blue line is a crude bundle method. And at a certain point, we switch to this local black box algorithm, and you see you get this very very fast convergence. So that's kind of the, uh, um, the, the sort of teaser, if you like, that, that, that perhaps the answer to this question has some, has, some, uh, has some potential. So that's where I'm going. Okay, so let me, uh, let me come, to the, come back to the first question. Yeah, if I can get... Mm, okay. Okay, so um, for the first question, what I'd like to do is uh, is start with an example, and it's kind of a non-standard uh, example, um, just to give you something a little bit different to look at. Um, it does fall into this category of, again, the kinds of problems that I'm interested in, which very often have to do with with eigenvalue optimization, but it's a rather it's a rather less standard example, and it involves the numerical radius of a matrix. So the numerical radius of a, of a square complex matrix um, is the maximum modulus of a point in the field of value. So that's a region in the complex plane described by the set of points you can get as, uh, as u star au, where u is a complex unit vector. So you take your square matrix A, you look at all these complex numbers you can get, that gives you what's called the field of values. That's a compact convex set by the terplitz hausdorff theorem. And you look at its maximum modulus, that quantity, it's actually a matrix norm, although it's not multiplicative. So it um, has some norm type, matrix norm type properties, but not all of them. Uh, it has the nice property of satisfying the, the so-called power inequality in linear algebra. So that dates back, you know, 50 odd years. Um, and it says that basically it, it satisfies this kind of key inequality that the, the, the numerical radius of the power of a matrix is bounded by that power of the numerical radius. So that, by virtue of an elementary inequality that relates the two norm, which is the thing that you're usually interested in because it tells you how big vectors become under, under, under the transient dynamics of this dynamical system, gives you some kind of control over, some kind of crude control over the dynamics of, of this system. So in, in, a, in a power type form. So that uh, is rather nice because unlike an eigenvalue bound, which gives you control over the asymptotic dynamics, tells you whether the system is asymptotically stable, these inequalities hold for all k with an explicit constant. So you get control over the, the, the intermediate dynamics before you hit the transient dynamics that you may not even see. So it's a, it's a sort of a, a crude control on the growth of the system in, in the short term. Okay, so um, Given that, one might make a case that it might be interesting to think about optimization problems involving the numerical radius. And, and if you try that out, you see a rather curious phenomenon that, that very often optimizing rho, not always, but often in the sense of a reasonable proportion of the time, optimizing the numerical radius in some optimization problem results in some rather unusual matrices. So I want to give you an example of, of this. So, so the, I, I've taken the canonical example of just computing the proximal point associated with um, the numerical radius. So I've just added a, a quadratic penalty and give sort of input a random matrix Y and then computed its proximal point. And, and very often what we'll see, I'll give you some numerics, is that the matrix that then pops out has a field of values that's a disk. So it's a very special field of values. In general, the field of values is a compact convex set. In these cases, very often, we'll see, you know, about half the time, the answer is a disk, okay, a rather unusual kind of matrix. So here, uh, here are some, so, so notice, that actually, this is something you can do in, in CVX. You can compute this proximal point. We did that on some, uh, on some examples, and then just checked numerically to see whether the, the answer is a disk matrix or not. And we, we did that either by computing the sort of inner radius of the field of values, which is easy to compute in Chebfun, 
or some kind of algebraic way that we can check whether the matrix is a disk matrix, and then a couple of other me measures that are also correlated with this property. So just purely and simply the matrix being singular and the matrix having a, a, a two by two null Jordan block. So, and so what I did, so here's some numerical results. So, um, so what we did is we took one of these measures, I actually don't remember which one it was. We, we ran a thousand instances of proximal point calculations and just you know, computed these measures and ordered the instances by, I think probably the first measure, measuring how far you are away from a disk. And, uh, and what you see is a kind of phase transition. So you know, about two thirds of the time, you get a very small measure, meaning that the matrix coming out has field of values very, very close to a disk. And that's true for all of these measures. So you get this phase transition. And this, um, so over various dimensions of the matrix, N, matrix A. So it's sort of rather compelling that some fraction of the time you're getting an exact disk matrix out from this calculation. And so the question is, why should that be, given that those matrices are rather rare? So those matrices in the, in the, the disk matrices within the set of all matrices are a rather small manifold. They have co-dimension 2n in a, in a set of, uh, in a 2n squared dimensional set. Okay. So that, that's, the, that's a, a sort of a typical example of this kind of phenomenon. You do some optimization, you get a rather unusual solution. The canonical example is, of course, the simplex method where you get extreme points. So you get something rather unusual from, a, from, from an optimization problem. So what's going on? Okay, so... Um, so not surprisingly, the answer is, is, is geometric. So um, non-smooth optimization is not just a, a sort of a, a, an, an ab, you're not working typically with abstract problems. Um, these, these, the sets that we're optimizing over are, are often structured. Um, and so what happens then? So when you solve a random instance, often that instance ends up having a solution on a manifold of solutions that you then see under perturbations to the problem. So if you make random perturbations to the problem, the corresponding solution traces out some manifold of solutions. So the, again, the canonical example is the is the active set um, uh, philosophy in 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 classical nonlinear programming, where your set is defined by a bunch of inequalities, and the manifold is defined the the so-called active manifold is defined by the active constraints. So you look at where the constraints are active very often that the, the active index set stays stable uh, relative, to the, relative to the data. Same kind of thing happens in semi-definite programming. The rank of the optimal solution often is stable under small perturbations to the data. Um, and we've seen this in, in, in the lasso problem too, in, in, uh, in L1 regularized um, smooth problems where you're trying to induce sparsity. And again, the sparsity pattern in this case often stays stable under small perturbations to the data. And, and then what we've just seen is this phenomenon with the numerical radius. So what's going on? What's, what's, the, what's the structure? So the, the history of kind of looking at this in a more geometric way, um, in some sense goes back to, well, in some sense it goes back to the active set methodology, but then in a more geometric way, it goes back to work of, of Burke and Murray, Steve Wright's notion of identifiable surfaces, and then more recently this notion of, of VU decomposition um, that, that was popularized by Mifflin and Sagastizabel, starting with them. So let me see if I can give you a more, a more sort of purely geometric perspective on this. So if you have this kind of geometry, what I like to call partly smooth geometry, that geometry is associated with an identification property of many algorithms, in particular first order algorithms, that, uh, that, that try to solve the problem. And it's that phenomenon that forces you onto that local manifold that then drives you towards the local convergence analysis of the, of, of, of the algorithm. So for example, uh, in the L1 regularization approach to, to inducing sparsity, if you look at proximal gradient methods, it's, it's very well known, it's been, it's been well known for a couple of decades that they typically, in some typical, in some generic sense, settle on a, settle on a certain sparsity pattern. So geometrically, what's happening is that you're, um, you've got this manifold M, you've got a, a non-smooth set, but you've got this smooth uh, sub-manifold sitting inside it. The optimal solution lies on it, 
And then as we optimize over it, sort of pushing ourselves in various slightly perturbed directions, we move around on this manifold in a, in a smooth way, depending on that data. Okay, the, the, the second problem is a sort of a slight extension of that where we think about nuclear norm regularization to, to induce um, to induce low rank solutions in, in matrix optimization. So for interest in low rank optimization, the proximal gradient now becomes essentially singular value thresholding. And again, the iterates settle on some kind of smooth manifold of, of fixed rank. And then once they're on that manifold, there's a kind of a linear convergence phenomenon that kicks in. So this was a, a phenomenon studied in a, in a sequence of papers by, um, by Liang, Fadili and Perret um, over the last half dozen years or so. Okay, so the way that I want to think about this is I want to take a, a sort of a step back from the, the sort of uh, uh, optimization framework and instead just think about it purely in terms of the optimality conditions. So think about a generalized equation, maybe a complementarity type system that somehow captures the optimality conditions. So for example, if we're thinking about um, optimization, in particular convex optimization, we move from the optimization problem to the optimality conditions that zero is a subgradient. And so more generally, we could think about generalized equations where we replace this subdifferential by a, a set valued mapping. So and, and think, OK, now I want to solve this, this set valued mapping. And, and I want to think about that for set valued operators that like the subdifferential map you from Rn to Rn, but in a set valued way. Okay, So go from Rn to Rn in a set valued way. That's what I mean by set valued operator here. Okay, so for example, we can model variational inequalities that way, something more general than, than purely optimization. So, so here's, a, here's a variational inequality. As is well known, we can reframe that using a normal cone kind of uh, formulation. Um, and, uh, and more concretely, if we're interested in composite optimization and breaking apart the optimality conditions using the, the composite structure, we can again write that in, in, a, natural, in a natural way involving a set valued operator only only involving this sum um, this sub differential composed with a smooth inner function okay so there are the stationarity conditions now then so what is it geometrically that's driving this this identification this this partly smooth structure now thinking about the set valued operator phi so this is the definition that that i think um underlies what's what's um you know at, at fundamentally a play and this definition has sort of gone through some interesting iterations it began life in a in a sort of an optimization framework where and we'll come back to that framework in a moment where it looks a little bit kind of dense and technical and involves a lot of things uh, interplaying with each other but now when you look at the definition that i'm going to give you hopefully you'll agree actually it's it's extremely simple that fundamentally what's going on is a constant rank property. So, um, so I'm going to call a set valued operator partly smooth at a solution u bar for given data v bar. So our problem is, okay, I want to find a u so that v bar lies in phi of u. Okay, so I'm trying to find the solution u for given data. And let's look at it around some particular solution u bar. Um, I'm going to call it partly smooth if the graph of this set valued operator is a manifold around the uh, solution data pair and furthermore that the projection operator that projects you from the graph down onto the variable space should have constant rank around that point so locally the rank should be constant so in other words when you so what does that what does that mean that's a sort of diff, basic differential geometric idea what that means is if you look at the tangent space to the graph and project it down onto the variable space then that new affine subspace has constant has constant dimension locally. So here's a here's a, a very kind of basic example. So this is a set valued map. There's a particular solution u bar v bar. Um, the graph of the set valued map is indeed a, a manifold around that point. And if I project the tangent space, which is just basically identical with the graph itself in this very simple example, if I project it down onto the variable space, which is sitting here. I just get a singleton so that so the dimension is constantly zero. Okay. So so that's an example of a of a set valued mapping that is partly smooth around the around the solution. 
Okay, now, you know, it goes almost without saying, I mean, there's, there's nothing deep going on here, that, that if that's the case, then uh, any kind of asymptotic solver, by asymptotic, what I mean here is that they have the property that as you go along, you're generating pairs U and V that lie in the graph of the, of the set value mapping. So anything that has that property that converges to U bar V bar, eventually you're going to get close to the graph. And so when you project down, you project into this into the projection of the manifold. It is indeed a manifold because of the constant rank property. And so almost by definition, you identify the active manifold M. Okay. So there's the, again, there's nothing deep going on. It's just a property of the man of property of the algorithm. If the algorithm identifies pairs in the graph and you then project down onto the variable space, you identify that manifold. Okay. All right, so, so let me give you a, a sort of a basic example. Um, so, so for example, if we think about closed convex sets, or, or more generally, if you're interested in the non-convex world, prox regular sets. So for example, defined by C2 inequalities, satisfying Mangazar and Fromovitz then uh, let's suppose that you've got an optimal solution for, for your optimization problem of minimizing uh, some linear function defined by the data vector y bar over the set s so in other words you have this you have this um this optimality condition then uh, and and this is kind of what i mean by um the 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 sort of what appeared to be a rather kind of complicated mix of of technical ideas coming into play in the optimization framework if, uh, as is often the case, this set S has a kind of ridge manifold, so it's got this ridge in it, this manifold M, so what does that mean variationally? That means that the normal space to the set spans the normal space to the manifold as you move around on it, and furthermore, both behave continuously. So you get this nice kind of ridge structure, and furthermore, a natural non-degeneracy condition, rather like strict complementarity, that says that the... Um, that the, that, the, that the data vector actually lies not just in the normal cone, but in its relative interior, then you have exactly this partial smoothness property that, that, that I've said, um, kind of, which I claim un underlies a lot of this fundamental smooth behavior. So that's, the, that, that's the, the broad picture in the optimization world. But as you can see, hidden here, the, con the fundamental constant rank property is kind of hidden in all the optimization. Whereas the way I framed it before says, okay, there's something very simple differential geometric going on, which is that this projection is constant rank. Okay. So, so what does that mean? So in particular, what that means is if you do projected gradient, if you use the projected gradient method on this, then because the projected gradient algorithm, at least in the in the convex case, is known to converge and and gives you a sequence of pairs in this in this uh, in in this graph of the optimality conditions, the normal cone graph, then by definition you will identify this manifold M eventually. So after finitely many iterations, you're going to land on this manifold M. The, the point X will land on the manifold M. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so let me do another example, which I'm going to come back to later, which is again a canonical, you know, the, the simplest example in some sense of, of non-smooth optimization, which is a max function. So now we have a max of, of K smooth functions, let's say C2 functions. Um, and uh, let's um, suppose, a, a, again, a kind of the, the strongest version of the optimality conditions we might hope for. So let's call uh, X bar a strictly active critical point when everything works in your favor just to make life simple. So you have the natural Lagrange multipliers, so a weighting of these functions so that the Lagrangian is zero. Um, and that furthermore, that, uh, that, that basically you get um, uh, some kind of strong convexity condition on the Hessians. Um, and let's suppose furthermore that those Lagrange multipliers, as I say, are kind of a strict, strict complementarity condition that guarantees the non-degeneracy, which is that each of those Lagrange multipliers should be strictly positive. So we're making life as simple as we can for ourselves to illustrate the picture. Then under those situations, the mapping that takes you to the subdifferential, which is just the convex hull of the active gradients, is indeed partly smooth. So that set valued operator is, is partly smooth relative to what we naturally think of as, as the active manifold, which is the, the set where 
all the active constraints, basically all the all the functions that you're taking the max of, all have equal value at the at the uh, current point. Okay, so relative to that active manifold, this this set valued mapping is is indeed partly smooth. Okay. Um, so, so this is kind of nice, but it's not all that interesting unless we think it it's um, broadly applicable in the sense of holding often. And it turns out that in concrete settings, that is indeed the case. So, so in some generic sense, if I give you a, a kind of a concrete set, and I'll explain what I mean by concrete in, in a moment, and then optimize in some random direction, then almost surely we expect this kind of phenomenon to hold. So, so let me let me make that um, a little bit more precise. So Sard's theorem, which is in some sense the motivation for, um, you know, why do we believe that Newton's method is going to converge for non for, for for smooth equations? Well, in some sense because of Sard's theorem. So Sard's theorem says, roughly speaking, that for smooth maps almost no values of a smooth operator are critical values in the sense of the Jacobian not being subjective. So we can ex expect you know, the kind of classical methods of, of numerical analysis to work usually. Um, and something similar happens here. So what about set valued operators and, and generalized equations um, on, on Rn? So something rather similar happens. So if we think about a, a concrete world, and for the, for the sake of argument, I'm going to take the concrete world to be the semi-algebraic world where the, where the underlying set-valued operator is, uh, is a, is a semi-algebraic set. So it's a finite union of finite intersections of um, polynomial level sets. And let's suppose furthermore that this semi-algebraic operator has an n-dimensional graph, rather like the graph of a smooth operator or the graph of a, of a monotone operator, which has the same property. It's a, the graph of a monotone operator is a, is a Lipschitz manifold, n-dimensional manifold. So let's suppose it, it's rather small in this sense. It's n-dimensional. So subdifferentials, for example, have this property. So subdifferentials, monotone operators, they are, they, they are n-dimensional in this two n-dimensional space. So if you have that property and, and they're semi-algebraic, then there's a very nice SARD type result well, that, that happens, and in fact, it's very structural. So around a generic data vector y, let's suppose you're trying to solve the generalized equation, zero belongs to phi of y, the inverse operator, the solution mapping, just decomposes into k smooth maps. There might be none because it might not be solvable. And uh, each, e e each one of those is, behaves sufficiently nicely that the underlying operator is partly smooth at y, around any solution. So you look at your data vector y, there might be several solutions. You look at any particular solution, partial smoothness holds. And furthermore, you have exactly the kind of nice transversality condition that you would want to apply a Newton type scheme to, to solve the equation. So generically, for a generic data vector y, all of those nice things hold. You get partial smoothness, you get transversal intersection of the graph with, with, the, with the variable, with the, with the x-axis basically. And so um, good stuff, you can expect good stuff to happen. All right, I just want to keep an eye on the time. Um, so that suggests that you might try a Newton type of scheme. So given this, let me just back up, given this transversality property here, you can hope that a Newton type scheme would, would work. And so how would that look? So again, this kind of Newton type scheme involves knowing lots about the structure of the underlying set valued operator phi. So what would we do? We, we could recast this problem as simply as a set intersection problem. So I'm trying to intersect the graph with the x-axis, helpfully called y here, sorry about that. And, uh, and then apply a Newton type scheme. And it's a Newton type scheme in the following sense. So obviously this set is, is very, very simple. So it's, a, it's just a subspace. So what we're gonna do in our Newton type philosophy is we're gonna in some sense linearize the graph and then trying to get a, try to get a Newton iteration going. Okay, so we're gonna assume a transversality condition between these two sets. So the way that I'm gonna frame this algorithm now actually doesn't depend on the, on the set Y being as simple as this, but when we try to do it computationally, that's gonna help us because we're only gonna linearize one of the two sets. So we assume a transversality condition that says the two normal cones intersect trivially. Um, we then linearize the set X around the current iterate. 
So, and look at where that linearized version intersects the other set Y, which in this case is this very simple set. So that's easy to compute by um, the, the, the assumptions that we have, essentially the transversality assumption, that point is gonna be very close to Z in terms of its distance from Z. So Z is the point of intersection we're looking for. So this is of order of quadratic order. So that's the first step. And then we somehow wanna get ourselves back to a point on X and so we can then cycle. And so we, we then look for a natural way of restoring ourselves um, onto, onto the manifold X. And we wanna do that in a Lipschitz-like way that doesn't blow up the distance from the point we're starting with with respect to, with respect to Z by, by more than a constant, okay? Combining these two, we'll get this sort of quadratic behavior that we want for Newton's method. So those are the two basic steps. So there's a linearization step, a Newton kind of step, and then there's a restoration step. A Lipschitz step. And so if we're actually doing this to solve an equation, um, what we do is uh, we'd linearize the set valued mapping. That's a kind of a derivative sort of operator. We'd solve that linearized version for the new point, and then we'd restore it somehow by projecting onto the active manifold. That's this step here. And then restoring ourselves so we get a we, we genuinely get a point in the graph. Remember the active manifold is in the variable space, and so now we want to find a new, a new a new value so that we're sitting in the graph, and, and that we do just by projection. So that's the, the sort of abstract picture of how the how the algorithm works. And so um so that's kind of nice and it recaptures as, as I'm as I'm gonna as I'm gonna say in a moment it recap in various structural settings if you kind of look and say well what does that mean in terms of various concrete settings it's very much of the um, SQP type of philosophy so it's a sequential quadratic programming type of approach so um, so that kind of approach depends a lot on knowing a lot about the structure of the underlying set valued mapping phi so in particular if we're doing optimization we need lots of structural knowledge about the subdifferential. So, for example, uh, as I said, it's 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 SQP in in uh, in, in in philosophy, and and a broad variety of so-called semi-smooth type Newton methods follow that kind of scheme. So these are so you can there are various um, long tracks: Clatter and Kummer, Fakine and Pang, Ismail Solodov and Ferro Trata. So you can see the Ferro Trata paper is actually kind of interesting. Um, because it's closer to this kind of broad philosophy in the sense of genuinely linearizing, linearizing the whole set valued mapping instead of um, some decomposition of it. Um, but all of these depend on some kind of uh, um, some kind of sophisticated structural knowledge of what the underlying set valued mapping phi is. So what the, the question that I want to pose now, and, and this we're moving into the second part of the talk, is what if you just have an oracle? What if you're just in a black box setting where you have no idea what you know, no um, explicit idea what the structure of this subdifferential is? So we don't have any way of breaking it apart into composites or as a max function or whatever. Okay. So in general, so so in general, we know in, in full generality, we know that there's a limit to how well we can do the the the, the subgradient method is the best we can do in a, in a worst case scenario, but in practice, we know that that methods like bundle methods, um, for for more subtle reasons, uh, are much more appealing in practice and can be pretty effective in practice. And there's a nice survey of those in in the most recent International Congress of, of Mathematicians by Claudia Sagastizabel. So, so practically speaking, we usually we would usually resort to a, a bundle method of some sort. Um, so, how do bundle methods work? If you're if you're not too familiar with them, essentially it's a cutting plane idea. You you sort of move around between so-called null steps, whose philosophy is to improve the quality of the of the cutting plane, and serious steps that aim at decreasing the objective. So you, you try and make a serious step. If you find the cutting plane doesn't give you enough information to decrease the objective sufficiently, then you do a null step, which improves the quality of the cutting plane. And then that has led over, over decades with people trying hard to try to think, well, is there some way that you can accelerate that process using the kind of partial smooth geometry that we've been talking about up till now? And that, that 
that kind of uh, philosophy is the sort of punchline of, of Claudia's ICM talk in, in 2018. So can you, can you accelerate? So the answer is potentially you can, um, although in a rather complex way, but I want to take a slightly different approach, which is to ask, well, let's actually mimic Newton's method a little bit more closely and ask, what if we, instead of just having a, a, an oracle for linear approximations, we had an oracle that gave you back a quadratic approximation to the function f? So what does that, what does that mean, given that the function f is not smooth? So what do I mean by a, a, a quadratic approximation? So what I mean by that is, let's suppose you, you know, the underlying function really was a max function. Suppose you were able to get access somehow to quadratic information about those ingredients. Okay, so more broadly, let's again think about convex functions. So convex functions are actually twice differentiable, at least almost everywhere. Um, black box method, so for example, if you run BFGS or you run a bundle method randomly initialized, then they don't encounter that set, so you, you never actually see that set, so you, you, the only points you actually encounter are points where the function actually is twice differentiable. Um, so what if you return that information? Can you use that information somehow to improve improve your algorithm? So it seems uh, at first sight it seems a little bit un unlikely uh, if the function is not smooth that knowing second derivative information is going to help you at all. But but I'm going to try to make the claim that that actually that can help you. So what's going to be our aim in this algorithm? So so as is usual in optimization um, in non-smooth optimization. We're going to aim. Try, we're going to aim to try to find a bundle of points with um, with small diameter. So, so a bunch of points close uh, near nearby each other. So closely clustered, where the corresponding gradients have a small convex combination. So when I get a closely clustered set of points, and the corresponding gradients uh, have a small convex combination, I'm going to decide that I've approximately solved the problem. And what's the motivation of that? The motivation is that we know that um, that as the cluster converges to a point, convex combinations of gradients give you the subdifferential. So in the convex case, and more generally. And so if you find a small convex combination, you know actually you've got a small subgradient of the underlying function. So we're gonna we're gonna declare success and stop. Okay, so here's the idea that I want to suggest has some has some promise. So this I'm gonna call this a K-bundle Newton method. So the idea is we're going to carry along with us a bunch of K reference points. And I'm going to talk about K uh, a, a little bit later, but K is going to play a crucial role. So in the classical Newton method, K would be one. In our max function case, K would be somehow we'd get access to the number of functions that are involved in the max. OK, we're going to carry along K points. And then we're going to use our oracle. Our oracle gives you linear and quadratic information. So we form the linear approximation just in the same way we usually do in the standard class in the standard cutting plane model, and we form a quadratic approximation. And then uh, we then do a kind of a, a familiar step from either a SQP philosophy or, or a bundle method philosophy. We say, okay, what's the shortest convex combination of gradients right now? So you can think of this as being you know part of the optimality check. So we, we choose these bundle weights, um, we choose a, a convex combination of the gradients to make the, the convex combination as short as possible. Okay, so basically we're trying to guess Lagrange multipliers here, least squares estimate of the Lagrange multipliers. Um, okay, and then using that, we then again follow the SQP kind of philosophy of forming the Lagrangian, um, and forming not its linear approximation, but the quadratic approximation. So we form the quadratic approximation to the Lagrangian and now minimize it. And here's the wrinkle. We minimize it over, not unconstrained, but over the set where all the linear approximations are equal. Okay. So for each reference point, we want the corresponding linear approximation to be, to be equal. And I'm sorry, that, that variable S should be X there. Okay, so we're, we're optimizing over, over X's where the linear approximations for these, these various bundles are all equal. So you can think of this constraint as being a linear approximation to the active manifold. So you're basically linearizing the active manifold and then minimizing a quadratic model of the Lagrangian. 
over that active manifold. So that's very SQP in philosophy. And then what do we want to do with that new point that we find? Well, remember, we're carrying along a bundle of K reference points. So what we're going to do is replace one of them. So which one should we replace? Well, we're going to replace the one with the closest gradient. And essentially the idea of that is that's a heuristic that tries to choose, if it was a max function, tries to update the max function for which you've got an improvement in the point. Okay, so you, 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 you update the one with the closest gradient. There are various possible heuristics you could try here. Um, okay, so, so that's the idea, that's the algorithm. And again, it just depends on a, on a quadratic oracle that, that returns the, the Hessian. Okay, so what, what's the motivation? Again, it's, a, it's an SQP type of motivation. So you have a current bundle of reference points. You build a max function type of model. So you, you model your function by a maximum of a bunch of smooth functions, one associated with each reference point. So those smooth functions match the given function, the underlying function up to second order around the corresponding reference point. You then try to optimize that in the natural way using sequential quadratic programming. How would you do that? You'd reframe it in the obvious way and then do an SQP step. So you'd estimate the Lagrange multipliers by least squares and then minimize the quadratic approximation of the Lagrangian. So that, that would be the philosophy. And what about the constraints? Well, again, that's SQP based in philosophy. You're, you're trying to, you're trying to um, optimize subject to the linearized constraints, which you assume to be all active. Now, one thing I want to emphasize about this algorithm, this is purely a local kind of an algorithm. So if we're a long way from the optimal solution, we have no reason to suppose that, that, uh, that, that we have this activity assumption here, that this is a good approximation of the, of the active constraints. But if we're close to the optimal solution, we have reasonable grounds to believe that this is going to be true. Okay. Okay, and then we, and then we use that new point that we find to improve the most closely matching component. Uh, so that's the, that's the update. All right, so let's, um, let's see what, what we know about that. So, so here's actually a theorem. So if the underlying function actually is a max function, so remember, we don't have access to these ingredient functions. We just have this black box that gives us the largest of them and its gradient and its um, Hessian. You give me x, it spits out the largest function value, the gradient of that function and its Hessian, but we don't see the functions themselves. Um, if each of those is strongly convex, so in the best of all possible worlds, each component strongly convex, you have a strongly active critical point, and uh, if you initiate it nearby with a full bundle, so you pick up each of these functions, so you have a bundle that somehow picks up each of the active functions, then this method actually converges k-step quadratically. Okay, so you really do get k-step local quadratic convergence. So, um, so what does this have to do with partial smoothness? So this, this, this bundle size, the magic number K that you have to choose in the algorithm uh, and, the, and the underlying geometry are related by this simple condition that, the, that those two numbers together add up to N plus one. So if you have some kind of geometric intuition about what this active manifold is, that corresponds to an intuition about the dimension K essentially. Okay. Um, Radu, how long do I have? Let's say uh, 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, perfect. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so let me, uh, let me very quickly sketch the, the, the kind of proof idea, and then I'm going to give you some, uh, some illustrations. Um, so as I said, the classical Newton method has k equals 1. Um, actually, let me start with one simple illustration, then I'll, then I'll come back to the proof. Um, so here's, a, you know, again, a, an extremely simple example. So I have a max of two functions, and I r run, this, uh, run this algorithm. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plot, um, so I'll, I'll plot a crude bundle method, a proximal bundle method. I'll use that bundle method to initiate, at a certain point, I'll use it to initiate the Newton scheme, and which again is a black box oracle remember it can't see this underlying function it just it's just given in terms of function values and, and hessians and gradients and i'll compare that with bfgs <clears throat> with non-smooth bfgs <clears throat> so the proximal bundle will be brown bfgs will be green 
this um, <clears throat> two bundle of Newton method will be blue. And I'll also keep track of the optimality measures. Um, so those are the optimality measures and, and the bundle diameter. So the objective function is going to be these crosses. Optimality measures are going to be triangles and bundle diameter is, are diamonds. So here's the picture. And um, you can see the, the kind of crude bundle method <clears throat> goes along steadily. BFGS does a little bit better. If we use the crude bundle method to initiate the, the Newton method, then after a couple of dozen iterations, you get this extremely rapid quadratic convergence, which is what you're hoping to see. So, so we get exactly the fast convergence that we're hoping for. It's essentially to machine precision. All right, now, of course, this wouldn't be very interesting if, if it was only applicable to max functions, because if, if it was only applicable to max functions, if you really do have a max function, probably you know it's a max function and you can access the ingredients. So what happens on a, on a non-max function? So here's a, a simple eigenvalue optimization problem. Um, so we, we've got a, a function of, of four variables. It's designed to have optimal solution zero. Um, and uh, again, I'm going to do the same thing, run, run BFGS, run uh, a simple bundle code, use the simple bundle code to initiate the Newton step. And again, this is not a max function, so the theorem doesn't apply, but we'd like, we, we hope to see fast convergence anyway. So that's not a max function around its minimizer. You can check that relatively easily. But it, it does have this partly smooth structure, this nice geometric structure relative to, uh, to in this case, a two-dimensional manifold. So that suggests geometrically we, want, we would like k equals three. So I'm going to run it, run this bundle Newton code with, with three reference points. And uh, here's the picture. And again, you, you don't get quadratic convergence, but again, you get rather fast convergence initiating from a certain point with the, with the, bundle, with the bundle point with that current bundle. And so this case in about in about three dozen. So these iterations, by the way, by iterations, I should emphasize those are calls to the Oracle. So those are black box function calls. Okay, that's what I mean by an iteration. Okay, so again, pretty good convergence on something that's not of the type that the algorithm was originally philosophically designed to deal with. All right, so, so how does the, the proof work? So, so again, the proof is for max functions. Why does it work? Well, when you're near the active manifold, these full bundles approximate the subdifferential in the sense that the convex hull of their gradients gives you an approximation of the subdifferential. That's relatively easy to see. Now, what about the Hessians, which we wouldn't have thought would give us much information? Well, it's true that they don't give you very good information in lots of directions. So in particular for that maximum eigenvalue func function, these Hessians actually blow up, so they don't behave well. But along the manifold M, they do correctly predict the curvature along the manifold M. So it's that behavior along the tangent space that is what gives you good Newtonian kind of information and drives the fast convergence. So that partly smooth geometry then ensures this kind of quadratic behavior in the max function case. And, uh, and then updating keeps the bundle full. So this heuristic for updating keeps the bundle full because of the strict activity. Um, all, the, all the gradients basically have to be active, so you have to pick them all up. And then finally, and this is the subtle point of the proof, the strong convexity argument guarantees that within k steps, you've updated each reference point. So every k steps that you do must update each reference point by the strong convexity assumption, assuming that you're within um, that you're sufficiently close to the optimal solution. So again, uh, under reasonable local conditions. Okay, so how would you kick this off? So kicking it off is, is a challenge, of course, like just as kicking off Newton's method is a challenge, in fact. Um, as I did in, this, in these experiments, um, we used a bundle method to, to start it. You can also use BFGS to initiate it. Um, if you want to start at some point nearby, you can use gradient sampling. You need some way of producing a big enough bundle. So in the max function case, you need to somehow generate a full bundle of points near the given point. And the, the, you know, the, the most natural way to do it is through a bundle type of philosophy. So they asymptotically generate these, these sub-differential approximations 
approximations. Um, and then, so what about this magic number K, which is so crucial to estimate? We could then use those subdifferential approximations, estimate the dimension of the convex hull of the gradients numerically. So that's a sort of a numerical estimate of the affine, the dimension of the affine span of these gradients, and use that as your as your estimate for the for the k that you should choose. So if you did this for a smooth function, for example, um, you'd end up with k equals one. Okay, because all the all the gradients would be rather close to each other, and so you'd end up with a with a um, with a with an estimate of k equals one. For a max of two functions, you get two different kinds of gradients, and you'd estimate k equals two. So that would be the idea. And then you'd somehow select, you do the selection problem to select a, uh, a, a maximally affine, affine independent set from the set of gradients that you have of size k. So that would be the, the numerical approach. Okay, so a slightly larger example just to try to convince you. Um, um, so, so this is a slightly bigger example. So these are um, 25 by 25 matrices, another maximum eigenvalue problem. Uh, an affine combination of 51 matrices, I guess. Um, in the random example we chose, the, the active manifold actually has multiplicity six. Um, and so you can compute uh, analytically the dimension of that, of that tangent space, which is 30. So that actually tells you in principle what the, what the dimension should be. Um, and, and this was the picture that I showed you at the beginning. And you can kind of see that the, the initiating from uh, after, in this case, 500 iterations of a crude bundle method, um, initiating the Newton scheme gives you this very rapid convergence starting from that point. And you can see if you keep track of the gap between the, the largest and the sixth largest eigenvalue, you can see that you sure enough are converging to that active manifold very rapidly to machine precision, essentially. So, so essentially you're getting a matrix that up to very high precision has a has an eigenvalue of multiplicity six. Okay, uh, I'm just going to summarize. So, um, how might we like to extend? You'd like to avoid using Hessians as most algorithms do. So, one way you can do that, and actually, we, we this is what we really do do. Um, automatic differentiation is becoming more and more accessible. So, one way to avoid actually analytically, you know, you somehow calling on Hessians is simply to use automatic differentiation. So if your oracle is a computational oracle that you can basically run PyTorch or whatever, then, then you can pull out the Hessians without too much more human work at least. Um, so that's actually quite effective. Um, what about a linearly convergent first order analog? Um, so that's promising, that's kind of work in progress, but again, similar kind of uh, philosophy looks like it has some promise. Um, what about the local convergence analysis? Um, so it would be nice to do this with non-convex functions. And actually, it turns out that that's rather easy. So there's an, again, because this is a lo purely a local theory, convexifying, you know, making a convex version, uh, making an algorithm, a version of the algorithm that works with non-convex functions is not that hard. Um, so that, that actually works. Um, more generally, what about partly smooth functions? That's what we'd really like to do. And we have no idea how to do that. So that would be great. Um, and, and then, of course, the million dollar question is how you globalize, like any of these methods, even Newton's method, but certainly active set methods, there's this issue of how you start, how you get sufficiently close, get a good estimate of what the, what the right bundle is, what the right bundle size is. And uh, that, that's, of course, a big challenge. So this is something of a teaser, a proofing concept, but the potential, I think, is, is there. So just to summarize, um, uh, I again want to push this idea of, of, of partial smoothness. Um, this, this, again, very simple, at, at heart, a very simple differential geometric idea that tries to capture this interplay between the, the smooth and the non-smooth behavior in, in, in concrete variational problems and, and helping you, hopefully, in the design and analysis of, of algorithms. And uh, I'll just end with some references. And um, thank you very much. So thank you very much for the very nice talk. Very elegant results, very elegant mathematics. So it's time for questions. Russell, Russell raised his hand. Sorry, uh, I, 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 
lost the opportunity to put my my video on maybe um but I, so i was reminded of um the notion of persistent homologies which um kind of a uh, was a fad at least a few years ago um topology and things like this and it, and it seems like there's an obvious connection to to uh, your idea of partial smoothness um and can you say a few words though about why you would expect some sort of regularity in in the transition because you're you're kind of counting on identifying a, a smooth manifold where the, where the solution lies but um but it's uh, there, there are lots of problems where you, you'll, you'll have lots and lots of different types of persistent homologies globally um and it's sort of the nature of, of uh, discrete optimization is kind of identifying the correct one and that's sort of what search algorithms right and at least heuristically try to do so could, could you say something about you know maybe pushing pushing this this idea to to other problems where you might have a whole zoo of, of sense of partial smoothness that might exist in various regions where you might search and how you would know that you're you're identifying the right the right manifold to be searching for. right right yeah no i mean it's an excellent question and and the closest analog i i think to that i mean you know the, the simplest analog is is again the classical active set approach to to nonlinear programming where when you're a long way from the optimal solution you know you you can you can try to identify the current active set make some improvement on it but then and then you need some kind of recourse for changing that active set for cha for changing the topology if you like and that that's what classical active set methods do in a in a in a clever way although it's not you know it's not easy right I and mean, that's what the simplex method does in some sense so um you need a way of deciding you know lagrange multipliers have the wrong sign um gradients become linearly dependent so that you know you've got too high a dimension and that's just difficult, I think. So I, I don't have a simple answer to that, um, but I think it's an excellent question. Um, but but it is work, you know, in those classical settings, it's workable. And, uh, and, and you know, what drives it ultimately, uh, again, is the fact that you, you have a kind of reliable local convergence. So when you fail to see that, it it must fail for a reason and the and that reason for example a lagrange multiplier having the wrong sign hopefully tells you what to do that's kind of the hope but we're a long way from that and it's a good question yeah thank you Russell. jonathan jonathan Eckstein. okay so, yeah, just very simple like like when you chose that crossover at 500 was there any like like indicator you know, even um heuristically that said okay that's when we should cross over <laughs> yeah yeah the, the heuristic indication was it was that it worked <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yeah no that we, we have no we have no magic um i mean you know we're, we're experimenting with them and there are heuristics but there's nothing very satisfactory uh yet um again we're a long way from that and uh, so again this is purely proof of concept, but the idea of, you know, when do you make that switch? Um, we, we don't have anything even, which is even like the analog of, of uh, globalizing Newton's method that sort of says that you can do this in a, you know, you, you, you can read when the thing is doing what it's supposed to be doing, right? Um, so that, it's a really good question, yeah. Thank you, Tim Hochheiser. Tim? Uh, I was just wondering, uh, since you mentioned uh, the, the notion or the, the paper by Krera and Utrata, if there is a connection between partial smoothness of F and the semi-smooth star property of the subdifferential operator. Yeah, um, again, that's another good question and a complex one. And, um, the, you know, one, one advantage I would claim about partial smoothness is um, it has a much nicer name than semi-smooth star. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, but I, 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 right, but I, I I like that paper a lot, uh, but it's it's complex, 
And to tell you the truth, I'm not exactly sure exactly what the connection is. So um, what, what is clear is that that approach is one of the very rare ones where they are genuinely trying to linearize the set valued mapping rather, rather, than, the, rather than the decomposition, right? So, so that, that brings it much closer to what I was talking about here. So it certainly would not surprise me if there are close connections there. Thanks. So we also have some messages in the chat congratulating Adrian. Zero board is writing bravo Adrian. And uh, Justo Puerto is, uh, yeah, likes uh, the geometric ideas. Yeah, uh, used to project optimization. And I have a question. So you, you mentioned uh, some extensions. Yeah, in, so I'm, I'm in particular interested, interested in, uh, in other convergence uh, results. So you mentioned, uh, okay, the non-convex case, which, which is also possible. Right. What about uh, the eigenvalue problem? Yeah, um, we, we don't know how to do that. Um, so, so the proof, the, the, the proof for the max function case is really delicate. I mean, it's just, I mean, you know, maybe there's an easy proof. I, I don't know, but, but it's like, it's, it's hot, like it was, it was hard and it's quite subtle. And in particular that the fact that you get this K step convergence really, really relies extremely heavily on the underlying structure. So we just have no idea right now how to how to generalize. Um, it may be that there's just a better proof technique out there that we we just we don't see. Um, but the proof technique that we came up with is 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 just you know it's kind of difficult. Um, it's uh, it, it, like it doesn't the intu the intuition it's the intuition is not clear. I mean to us it worked. We 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 believe it works. I mean we we check the proof pretty carefully, but the intuition is not. Yeah. is not of a kind that allows an, a, an easy extension to us anyway. Maybe, maybe somebody out there <laughs> smarter than us can do it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes? So, so, so Adrian, yeah. uh, I have a more computational question. The recent years are more computational. Now, you talk about non-smoothness in a more abstract way. We talk about small f. Is, uh, but in practice, Look at all the examples you have uh, uh, presented. Essentially involves smooth functions plus non-smooth functions. So the non-smooth function normally are pretty simple. Essentially you have a composite optimization problem. Have you thought about this case? Do not work on the general non-smooth function. You work on a composite problem. You have a smooth function and a simple non-smooth function. Essentially, you know every property of the non-smooth function. Can you do that and make your algorithm to work? I think that will be more practical in computation. But this is a more computational. Uh, you're talking right. about more abstract. Yeah. yeah. So 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 again, that's, you know, these are all great questions. So that, and that is a very good question. And my I on that question, I would just be very modest and say, I would be surprised if the ideas here are useful in that situation. I, I don't think that this is a, you know, I think there are gonna be way better ways of doing that than what we're doing here. Because, you know, having access to all that structure, you know, you, you have, you know, for the, for, the, for the convex outer function, for example, you can call on interior point type code. Uh, you know, there are kind of a smoothing technique, Nestroff smoothing type techniques. And that it pulls you back into a into a realm where you've got many, many, many more techniques available to you than. And so I just don't I'm, I'm not sure I believe that our ideas here are going to be useful in that setting. You know, maybe I'm wrong. I'd love to be proved wrong. But um, but our idea, the idea here is so, so the only the only place where I would differ from you a little bit, it is true that that um many many optimization problems non-smooth optimization problems come with lots of explicit structure and then obviously you should use that explicit structure but on the other hand either because people are lazy or you know because the function is coming to them in some black box that they you know can't quite get into the idea of a of a black box algorithm is still really appealing i think um and so, and you know, you see lots of lots of evidence of that in the in the code that people use. You know, people people. You know, maybe it's just because people are lazy. They want to just say, "Hey, take my problem, shove it into this black box, and off you go." I don't want to mess around with the structure. 
So if you know the structure, you should definitely use it because there are going to be way better algorithms out there, I think. Um, you know, many of which are due to you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. Agree. <laughs> Good point. So thank you very much. So then uh, probably you should stop here. And uh, thank uh, Adrian again for a very nice talk. Uh, yeah, very nice mathematics, very deep results. So thank you very much, Adrian. Thank you very so, much. And uh, my, my greetings to everybody. I, I think in this uh, COVID world, we're supposed to stay, stay safe or something like that, but yes. hey. <laughs> so I just want to announce that we'll post a video in the slides on, the, on our website. And hey, then, I, so, I, will, I will say this, I miss you all. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Adrian. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for a nice talk. Yes, yes. thanks Radu for organizing so, this. I series. just want to mention that the, the speaker next week will be Steve Wright. Okay. So, have a nice week. Stay safe. See you next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you for a great talk. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks, Radu. Thank you. Yeah. See you. Bye bye. Bye.